There we go. Well, let's let's go ahead and get started then. Welcome everyone. I'm Mike Coffey, president of Imperative Information Group. For over 24 years, Imperative has helped risk-averse businesses make well-informed decisions about the people they involve in their business. And in addition to doing that, we do a ton of other kinds of educational services, including uh, webinars like this. And this will be webinar 13 or 14 that's recorded on our website and is approved for credit. And so you can, if you're not watching this live, at the end of the webinar, there, uh, there will be a, a code that you receive in order to uh, get the research credit. But if you're watching it live, just watch the webinar and we will email you uh, the research uh, information. First, you'll, we'll ask you to complete a poll to tell me how I did, and then we'll send you the research information. So uh, you can get it that way, or uh, you can come later to the website at imperativeinfo.com slash webinars and all our recordings are there as well. And I will just add that every week I uh, drop a podcast called Good Morning HR, the podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value for shareholders, customers, and the community. And all of those episodes are approved from anywhere from half an hour to a full hour of research credit. And some of those are even approved for business credit or ethics credit for HRCI certified professionals. So that's how I spend my time, plus consulting with our clients around their employment uh, process, their employee selection process, and the occasional uh, employee relations issue. But I've got an amazing team back at the, uh, you know, in the background at uh, the back office at Imperative doing all the hard work. So I just get to spend most of my time doing fun stuff, speaking at conferences, and helping clients solve their problems. So that's about me. Let's jump in here and find out about you. I am going to launch a poll here. I say I'm going to launch a poll here. There we go. Launch the poll. Continue. There we go. So tell me who you are and uh, and what your current circumstances are. A couple of questions. I want to know what your role is and compared to a year ago, in your recruiting role at whatever level you have recruiting, uh, what kind of challenges have you had as far as ethical issues? Kind of curious. Okay, people are still answering. I'm gonna grab a drink of water. Okay. Still. Give you a few more minutes to go ahead and finish that out. There's about a third of the of you, it looks like have answered. I'm gonna shut it down in five, four, three, two, one. Ending the poll. Let's look at the results. So it looks like uh, about a quarter of you are in-house recruiters. None of you are outside recruiters, so we can make fun of them today. Uh, and uh, some of you are just uh, about over half of your HR professionals with some recruiting, employee selection, and uh, responsibilities. And 17% of you are someone else. So um, whatever that means, I will, uh, you know, I'm glad you're here anyway. So, and then as far as compared to a year ago, what kind of pressure are you uh, experiencing? 17% of you are experiencing more pressure to, to cut ethical corners, about a third of you the same, and about half of you have never felt any pressure to cut ethical corners. Well, well that's, that's half of you are in a really good position then, uh, or you're just so shady already that uh, uh, it, you didn't have to cut any corners, but I'm going to assume that you're just in, uh, working in an amazing places where you haven't felt that. But so that that kind of gives us an idea of where everybody's at. So about half of you have some feel some pressure and, uh, you know, a number of you are feeling more pressure. And then on the flip side, uh, another half of you have really never felt that pressure. So we're going to talk about some of those issues today. Great. So. I want to start where I usually do when I'm talking about any of the ethical issues we talk about with the Edelman Trust Barometer. 
Uh, Edelman is a PR firm based in the UK, but a couple of times a year they do an annual or do a worldwide survey of the public's trust in different kinds of institutions. Uh, and their most recent one was a special uh, survey they did in the fall of last year on trust in the workplace. And uh, I think you'll see where I'm going here pretty quickly. Um, the, the first issue is that when we're talking about the different institutions that people trust, it surprises folks often when they see this that business is the most trusted institution in most societies. Uh, that's, you know, they, people trust business over non governmental organizations, nonprofits, charities, things like that, over the government, and certainly more, uh, they're more likely to trust uh, business than the media. So all the things that the media tells us often in, in, in popular media about how, uh, you know, how evil business is and how people don't trust business. Well, in fact, business overall across uh, borders internationally, worldwide are still businesses are still more better trusted than any of these other institutions. And employers are a lot, just they're the, a source of, of stability. You can see here, uh, my employer, whoever I work for right now, is currently the highest rated. Um, they've got over the average trust, 21 points more, more trust than all the other institutions combined, uh, over the average of all the other institutions. So what that really means is people trust the companies they work for. They trust their employers. And this is another example of that. Look who they trust. They trust their coworkers more than, than anybody else. They trust their direct manager. They trust the head of HR. Woohoo! And they trust their own CEO. That's pretty wild. And then it's really interesting when you compare my CEO, they trust at 69% uh, trust level. Other CEOs are 62. So again, people trust the people they're familiar with. They trust the institutions they're familiar with. They, and the, they trust their own leadership more than they do the leadership of other organizations. And then certainly the heads of non-governmental organizations or journalists or government leaders, they all have lower trust than the people that make up the workplace where these individuals go to work on a daily basis. And um, when you look at what we want uh, to see, you know, from our employees as far as what we traditionally call engagement or interest in the in the you know I mean, positive outcomes of the organization, uh, the folks who trust their employer are forty seven percent more likely to advocate on behalf of their employer to tell people, hey, this is a great place to work or our products are amazing. So the more they trust their employer, the higher they are, the more likely they are to be advocates for your brand. They're your salespeople in the community. They're, they're, they're a lot more likely to have a higher level of engagement. They're proud of their organization they, and they support our, our objectives. Uh, they're more loyal and they have a higher level of commitment. So what that really means, and I can't stress this enough, and I'm when, every time I'm talking to, to organizations where there are clients or I'm speaking at conferences, I always wanna stress that this trust exists and it's only ours as leaders of people to screw up, right? I mean, it's if we can do a good job of continuing to deserve their trust, by making the right kinds of decisions, treating them the right way. In other words, doing the right thing, being ethical, then our organizations are going to perform better and uh, we just need not to squander that trust. And sometimes that means we have to make hard decisions about what we do in unique situations uh, that may not seem to be in our immediate short-term interest, but as far as building trust and building relationship with our, with our teams, they're critical and they're going to serve us over the long term. Doing the right thing pays off. So let's get into what we're talking about when we're talking about ethics. First, there's compliance, right? That's just the basic, you know, that, those are table stakes, just following the basic rules. 
you know, we know what the law says about our industry and how we conduct. I mean, if we're HR professionals, we know what Title VII says. We know what the ADA says. We know all of that stuff. And we're just following the law, being compliant is a first step, but that's just table stakes. That's just the cost of opening the doors every day. If we don't do that well, then everything else we talk about today doesn't matter. It's HR 101. I uh, talked to a, a business leader not long ago who uh, I knew their HR leader and I, I mentioned to him. So I saw that he, the, their HR leader had left and he said, yeah, he did an amazing job in building culture and all of, all of that for us, but we needed just more basic HR 101 stuff, blocking and tackling, taken care of. And that's probably the, the, the thing that I always stress to HR folks. It's important to focus on culture. It's important to, to, to do all of the things that we want to do to make our place the preferred place to work. But in order to get there, payroll has to go out on time, right? We've got to be able to make sure we're, the company is not exposed legally. We've got to do the basic HR blocking and tackling before we can ever really talk about those other things that give us the seat at the table. And so compliance is the first step. We've got to do it well. But in and of itself, compliance doesn't necessarily mean that organization is ethical. And in, in my ethics presentation, it's a full uh, hour uh, webinar that's on the website uh, about ethics. I go into the example of Enron and, and Andrew Fastow, who was their CFO. And so go look at that if you want more information around that. But um, we can be compliant and still not be seen as our by our employees, by our community, by our customers as as ethical. So compliance isn't it. Then, so what's next? Well, what is the DNA of our organization? And I argue that the DNA of any organization are the organization's values. What are the behaviors that as an organization we incentivize, that we um, we reward, that we actually hire to? Those are the things we really value in an organization. So sometimes our, our values are up on the wall and they say these things, but every time our employees see them, they're like, yeah, but I know what really gets people promoted in our organization. I really know who we hire. I know the kind of managers that we recognize and reward. And so regardless of what you've got on your name badge, as far as your values or the back of your pay stubs or wherever else, the reality is your employees know what you really value. But values are a key part, and they're the first step towards building an ethical environment. Uh, and we need alignment between what our employees value and what the organization values. And it needs to be clear what the organization really values. And so I've got an, a presentation just on values uh, and, and evaluating your organization's values also on the webinar for credit. But even beyond that, there can be things we value but they still may not seem to be the right thing in certain circumstances. And when we're talking about ethics, we're talking about just doing the right thing. What is morally right? So compliance is, is certainly part of that, uh, you know, and making sure that we're protecting our stakeholders, um, our investors, our employees, providing a safe work environment, protecting the investment of the company, protecting um the organization's reputation, those are all critical. But beyond, there are situations where um, one person's ethics and personal, you know, our values drive our ethics, the things we value drive our ethics. But it's possible to live according to my own values and still be seen as unethical by society. We don't always have full agreement as to what is ethical in society. And that's, and that's what the rest of this webinar is really going to be about. Because we, um, we may not agree with what's morally right or wrong in different situations. And if we, you know, you've got issues here on the screen that in the last few years we've dealt with, uh, as you know, some people love Elon Musk's uh, purchase of Twitter, some people hate it. Um, think about all the chaos we went through during COVID about masking and shutdowns and, uh, va you know, vaccination mandates, all those things. Um, does that mean, you know, and often we often just make the decision, 
that person's wrong because they disagree with me. But in off, you know, in reality, maybe they're approaching, we don't have enough information to know where they're coming from often. And so just because somebody disagrees with us, we have this tendency to th say, well, they're wrong, but they may not be. It may simply be that we disagree. And so it's important for us, um, you know, if, if we can't even reach agreement on a social level, at, at the level of our society, then inside our workplaces, we've got to just accept there are going to be times where we don't agree and where what you think is the right thing to do and what I think are the, is the right thing to do are going to be two different things. And why does that happen? Well, our personal ethics are shaped by our individual backgrounds. Now, if you if you listen to the podcast or you watch my webinars or see me present, I am I am not someone who um, focuses heavily on the things that divide people. Um, you know, whether that's phenotypic traits or cultural backgrounds or any of those things, I'm a you know come to the party as you are kind of guy, and but we got to realize that people have different experiences and we all judge right and wrong based on our experiences, our religious, cultural, social, economic experiences. Um, those are the things that shape us. And let's face it. I'm a reasonably attractive 53 year old white male who grew up in Texas. That is definitely going to shape who I am. And it doesn't make it any of that bad. It's just recognizing that is going to be very different than the experience of someone with a completely different set of demographics in their background, different experiences. They're going to view the world differently. And we've got to be ready for that. Now, there are certain cultural norms that, that are set across society and certain expectations for behavior that seem in concrete and stable. But even those are changing over time consistently. Uh, you think about some of the hot issues in uh, in our society today. The most, the one probably the most, you know, hot politically hot potato or football that, that both sides are using are uh, trans rights, and that we would even have the conversation we're having right now versus what we were how we would have had it twenty years ago shows how things are changing. I think we're making real progress uh, in, in a lot of areas that, uh, you know, we may not be where everybody wants us to be right now. And we as a society have to work it out. But things are changing all the time. And we have to be ready to evaluate our own ethical standards and our organization's ethical standards against what's happening in society and the, the, the conversations that are happening out there around how things change. Uh, it seems easy from where we're staying now to look back and say, what were those people thinking? And I think maybe we need a little humility to say, okay, what is it that I'm thinking right now that may not even be, you know, that I may be embarrassed about in 20 years? And, and why do I think that now? And what could change in my behavior or in my understanding of the world that would change how I, how I view this into the future? Uh, that takes a certain amount of humility and maybe some mindfulness uh, about understanding why we think the things we think and how somebody else may view them differently. Often we fail to see that when we were faced with ethical decisions or when people disagree with one another, nobody's wrong. It's just a choice of right versus right. You know, apple or an orange, you know, neither of those are, are a bad choice. But in our, in our conversations, we often seem to say, well, you know, what I think is the right thing. So as an organization, we've got to have a framework or a structure to, to decide how we are going to deal with those circumstances. When we're going to make choices, what is the structure, the framework through which we go through, that we go through to make, decide for our organization what the right thing is? because we do not live in a binary world. And I think that's the biggest problem we've got in our politics and a lot of our social conversations. We see everything as black and white, and it's not. We've got, a, a, you know, we've got a, a whole kaleidoscope of colors out there, and maybe none of them in many circumstances are wrong, 
um, and we need to make room for more opportunities uh, to have the conversations and then decide for us personally, for us in our communities and in our organizations, what are we going to do? What's our process for reviewing and determining what's right for us? And then how do we communicate it? And one way we do that, certainly if we're for, for those of us who are oops, professionals and have some sort of uh, code of conduct for whether you're an HR professional or you're an attorney or whatever it is, there are organizations publish codes of conduct for people in that profession. And that's one way to do it, right? Uh, just, you know, a code of ethics, codes of conduct. We can look at it and say, this is what we do. You know, if I'm if I'm an attorney, I can go to the, the professional ethics for lawyers and say, okay, here's the here's the challenge I'm facing. And kind of here's here's how we need to respond to it according to our professional ethics. And there are fewer black and white ethical standards published out there for HR professionals, uh, but there are different certifications that are available. And often, you know, for instance, HRCI, for somebody who's HRCI certified, they're at least requiring you to go and think about these things, that you've got to have some continuing education around ethics for any true certification cycle. So, uh, you know, certifications are a great way to start those conversations uh, for professional organizations. Now, in our organizations, the larger organizations, especially those that are publicly traded, have some sort of board. They've got a corporate governance system in place that includes policies and practices and accountability that their board or other leadership has put in place to protect the shareholder's interest, to make sure that uh, managers in the organization aren't self-dealing, uh, that uh, we are complying not only complying with laws but that we're also not just the you know the black and white of the law but also the spirit of the law uh, maybe we're also focused on things like corporate social responsibility and those kinds of things as an organization we say these are the things that this organization is uh, uh, supports on LinkedIn a, a few weeks ago I, I posted a poll about how socially active, do we should, do we think organizations should be? And I'm surprised that over half of the respondents said they thought corporations should stay out of politics or even commenting on social issues. Well, another thing you would see if if uh, you looked at the whole Edelman survey is that that is the exact opposite of what employees want from their employers. And, you know, when employees have said they want to see their their workplace, their their boss, their companies they work for, take in their leadership, take stands on social issues. And so we've got to balance that. Some organizations have said, uh, especially in, in, in the last year or two, hey, we're not going to talk about these social issues at work. That's not what we're here for. And and good for them. I mean, that's that at least they've made a decision and they're not getting drawn back and forth by not uh, you know by being wishy-washy about what their position is. Um, so good on them, but the, I think the trend is going to be more and more for employers to, 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 and companies to take positions, but I think they don't have to be as black and white binary. You're never going to please everybody, but I think you can say, um, you know, we as an organization generally treat people this way. This is how we we would. This is a society we'd like to be part of, and that we're working to create. And then some people will say, "Hey, I love that. I want to work for you." And other people are going to say, "No, that's awful. I don't want to work for you." But at least they know who you stand, what you stand for. And then, of course, once you say that, you have to stand for it. You have to uh, include that in your planning and how you run the organization. And how you, those decisions are going to make a difference in your organization. They're going to affect your culture. When you start uh, making it clear to the rest of the organization, to the people you hire, to your, your customers, but also your the employees, uh, prospective employees, candidates who are looking, the more they understand who you are, the more you're going to attract people who agree with those value sets. And I love this quote by John Amici. Uh, I use it in a lot of presentations, uh, but I think it's it, he's really right. Um, it's the outliers 
that really reflect what our culture really is. Uh, you know, what bad behavior do we as an organization support? Because it gets us the outcomes we want, even if the behavior isn't right. So what kind of management uh, things that shouldn't happen do happen? And we look the other way, but we still reward that manager for high performance in some other areas. Those are the things that really define our culture. And, uh, and, and really, those are the things we value. Uh, if, if we value that manager who beats his people up all the time, and um, that's what gets him results, and even if it's, uh, you know, re results in 40% annual, 50% annual turnover, we'll live with it because he's getting us results. Well, there's your problem. Okay. And, and you're not, you're, you know, eagles don't fly with turkeys. You're not going to keep the best employees when you have that kind of culture. And what you're going to get uh, is more, uh, more misbehavior, more misconduct when you, when you reward misconduct. Um, one in five, about 20% of employees experience pressure to bend the rules. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, Ethics and Compliance Initiative uh, from 2020's uh, survey. But think about that. If in your organization, do a, you know, uh, one in five people feel pressure to bend the rules? What does that mean for your organization? That, that, that suggests that there's some real ethical issues. There's not a clear definition of what's really right and wrong. We may put in writing, this is what the rules are. But when it comes down to it, we're, we're rewarding other behavior or at least tolerating other behavior. And the problem with that is that uh, those employees who feel that pressure, that 20% that feel that pressure to bend the rules, are twice as likely to have observed other kinds of misconduct in the workplace. So the the more the more somebody sees misconduct in the workplace, the more pressure they're feel going to feel personally to engage in misconduct because that's what gets us ahead. Um, if if you know if I see my peer excelling in and raises and promotions and just praise from leadership, even though they cut all the corners all the time, they don't follow the rules. Um, what does that tell me? It tells me I need not follow the rules. If I'm going to get ahead in this organization, I'm I'm going to definitely I'm you know going to feel pressure to bend the rules, to break the rules, to to do the wrong thing according to what the organization has allegedly said. Is, 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 you know, what our rules are. And so we need to realize when we're tolerating bad behavior in our organizations, we're creating, delivering a cognitive, a cognitive dissonance to our employees and makes them less certain that the, uh, you know, that what they're supposed to do in different circumstances and that the organization is really what it claims to be. We're all familiar with conscious capitalism by now. Uh, John Mackey, who was the uh, founder of uh, Whole Foods and Raj Sodia from Harvard Business School, uh, put this together. They, they, their argument is that companies have six primary stakeholders, and then some of them are obvious: our customers, our investors. Okay, those are the stakeholders, and our employees. Okay, so there's three stakeholders. But then we've also got vendors and suppliers, and they include those folks as stakeholders. What is our relationship to them? They have a stake in how we as an organization operate. Do we pay our bills on time? Do we hold vendors out for 90 days um, every time? Those kinds of situations. And so how we treat them makes a difference to uh, the kind of organization we are. Then we've got a, a responsibility to our communities. And so... What, how does our organization impact the community that we work in? Uh, we, and we can impact people a lot of ways. We're talking about talent acquisition today. We can impact our communities by how we recruit employees, where we recruit them from, what outreach do we do to non-traditional employee, non-traditional for our organization, uh, uh, you know, employee sources, uh, second chance hiring, uh, you know, reevaluating our requirements for college degrees for certain jobs, 
you know, how are we improving our community by expanding the opportunity pool? Um, then there are other, even other circles like the media, other, uh, you know, government and uh, unions, activists, all kinds of other outside individuals who also have at least an interest in what our organization is going to do. And, uh, and probably it's fair to consider their interest as well as we develop what our organization says is right and wrong and how we're going to conduct business. So those are the stakeholders that they're talking about for a company. But as we talk about the recruiting role, who are our stakeholders as recruiters? When I'm, I'm, It's not really that different, right? Certainly the companies, owners, and investors, they're stakeholders. They're directly impacted by the quality of the individuals we bring into the organization and how good the fit is. Um, and so certainly the other one would be candidates. It's obvious that candidates have a, an ongoing interest. Um, the hiring manager, if I'm the recruiter, the hiring manager has a big stake in the outcome of my efforts. And so considering what the hiring manager needs to be successful in a row, sometimes what the hiring manager needs is education rather than the, the, uh, the candidate that he thinks he wants. Then obviously the, as, as a recruiter, the community also has uh, an interest in what we do. And as I said earlier, where we recruit from, uh, what's our involvement uh, in, in job fairs for high school students? Uh, what's our involvement in just helping uh, you know, high school students or emerging, the emerging workforce uh, get skills like interviewing or understanding how things work in, uh, you know, in applying for a job and those kind of education things. Those are things that recruiters are ex experts in and how can we share our, you know, impact the community by just sharing our knowledge. And then obviously the government, uh, that's another obvious stakeholder. We spend a lot of our time in, in talent acquisition and HR looking at what uh, government requirements are, Title VII, OFCCP, whoever, whatever organization, ADA, um, all those things. We, we're looking at compliance, uh, but also trying to understand, hopefully, what the intent is there and trying to find ways to uh, re, you know, achieve higher social uh, outcomes than just strictly following what the law says and requires that we do. So let's jump in the chat box real quick. What other uh, stakeholders might there be in the recruiting and a recruiter's ethical behavior? Who else has a stake in a recruiter's ethical behavior? Just drop it in the chat. I'd be curious to see what you think. Now, if you're watching the recording, you're not going to be able to do this, but uh, and I'm just going to sit here until till somebody says something at least. So who else has an ethical interest in what uh, in, in what a, a recruiter does? Other employees, there's a good one. That's And that's not there. That should be up there. It's, that makes sense. Other employees definitely have to, uh, they're going to be impacted by who we bring in. And in our recruiting process, do we let um, nepotism creep in? Uh, if you've ever worked in an environment where nepotism was rampant, and I have at one point, um, it's real disheartening, right? You see somebody who's somehow related to or has some special connection to an executive, and they come in, and all of a sudden, they're, um, you know, they're on the same level as me, and they've gotten zero experience, and and I'm having to train them all. There's there, That creates problems, right? Uh, customers, yeah, uh, definitely our customers are impacted by uh, the quality of uh, and delivery of, you know, who we put into a certain role. And uh, especially if, if it's, you know, you know, roles that where quality is an issue or, or they have to, somebody's interfacing with a customer and uh, we've got to get the right skill set and knowledge there. Um, yeah, our internal staff, onboarding specialists and, and the people who are helping integrate those new employees into the organization vendors yeah or, um yeah basically what we're saying i think is the same set of stakeholders that the organization has are also going to come back uh 
to uh, to looking, you know, impacting. We're going to impact the same way with uh, what our behaviors are as uh, the talent acquisition experts. Oh, Kyle, that's great. In the healthcare environment, our patients' families. And that's something that's that's really true, right? They're not our customers. They're our customers, you know, uh, community. But we're going to impact them in how uh, in how we uh, how the people we require and the environment certainly uh, are my, those all those those things that we that we said on the previous screen for employer uh, for companies uh, that John uh, uh, John Mackey and Raj Sodia put out there. They're also going to impact what we do so the thing is there's no standard set of ethics for all recruiters uh and each organization is going to have to decide for itself what ethical talent acquisition behavior is based on the organization's values and how they're recorded in policies and procedures and a lot of this is unfortunately we figure it out as we go and we don't have uh a lot of um guidance uh and so we, we you know that's and that's the importance of being part of your local sherm chapter and other networks and communities where you can go ask hey i've got this unique situation what would you do in this situation or what would you consider well i've put together seven high high level ethical statements for talent acquisition purposes that i think may be helpful to start the conversation now these are my creation and they may not reflect your organization's values, but um, what statements would you add uh, to the law beyond comply with the law or comply? What statements would you add to your ethical statements as talent acquisition professionals that aren't here? I said comply with the law, act in the best interest of the company, educate hiring authorities, communicate in a timely manner. I hear all kinds of complaints from both applicants and hiring managers that they don't get the feedback that they need in real time. Now, I know I also hear from uh, recruiters all the time that managers are hammering on you to hire people, but then you can't, they never respond when you need to schedule the, uh, the interviews and, or need feedback on the candidates. Um, be honest and transparent, cast a wide net for talent, treat all candidates fairly. What else would you add to, to this list of just, this is gospel according to coffee. This is my stuff. What would you add uh, to uh, doc, you know, to, to things that you would guide your uh, talent acquisition decision-making around? Anybody got anything else you would add to this? I keep telling my wife, I'm a genius. And maybe maybe I really am. Uh, I've covered it all here, but I think there are probably other considerations. Advocate for diversity, advocating for employees or the candidate. Okay, let's do advocate for diversity. Yeah, that's what I meant by the cast a wide net for talent, right? Um, let's figure out, you know, where do we get our best talent from? What do we do uh, as an organization to attract the most? We always want to hire the most qualified people, the people who are going to be most successful in the role. But there are, you know, we've, and I, and I just did last month a webinar on mitigating bias in the employee selection process. And go watch that, if, you know, because that's I did a basically a whole hour, didn't I, Diana, on on that issue. But the, um, I think advocating for, uh, for diversity, and I don't, and see, here's where I will probably step in it at some point, but I don't think diversity for diversity's sake is, is the right reason to do it. I think the right reason to do it is because you get the best talent when you have the widest available talent pool available, and you're not eliminating people from consideration for dumb reasons that aren't related to the outcomes of the job. And so sometimes that means we have to go actively encourage people who don't think they're qualified for the job or that you wouldn't consider them for whatever reason, because I had, you know, I had this criminal history or, um, well, you know, my my dress style is non-traditional for at least that organization or, uh, you know, my age, race, sex, national origin, religion, any of the things people subtly feel that, well, that's the kind of organization that wouldn't hire somebody like me. Well, maybe we need to go actively encourage those folks to consider working for us 
And what I'm, I'm not saying we're ever going to choose a, you know, let any of those things be their preference reason we hire somebody. I would be totally opposed to that. But at the same time, to get the most of, of you know, the most diverse available talent available, you know, to apply for the work, sometimes we got to do that. And we said, let's see what else, advocating for the employees or the candidate. Yeah, making sure that, and, and by advocating, I Courtney, I'm, I'm guessing you mean advocating for them and ensuring that they're treated fairly and that we communicate with them and that your hiring managers aren't knuckleheads and how they evaluate candidates. Because we've all worked with those managers who think they've got this unique insight into the human soul and they will definitely apply that sometimes. And it means that the better qualified candidate doesn't get fair consideration because either they've got a bias for this candidate or against this candidate. And neither of those are really job related sometimes. Uh, consistency. Oh, preach, Helen. That's right. Consistency is so important in, in how we do things. And, and, and your employees see the inconsistencies. Your applicants may not have enough relationship with you to know that, but your employees definitely see when we're inconsistent in our processes, where somebody, you know, one process, uh, somebody jumps ahead of the line, uh, you know, ahead of everybody else for some reason, but we're not sure why. And then everybody else has to go through this really strict process that, you know, we have a policy that everybody goes through five different interviews. Well, is that if that's our policy, which is a horrible policy, but if you've got that policy, then let's talk about why that person, this other person only had to go through two and why, what do you know, why do we have these different situations? um that and that seem uh yeah diana that's right inconsistency equals discrimination often it does and even if it doesn't mean discrimination your candidates or your employees are going to think it is if people anytime people feel like they weren't treated fairly and often that just means they don't have enough information we haven't been transparent with them enough they're going to feel, I mean, every applicant you ever had thought they were the most qualified person for that job, right? And so short of any transparency or understanding of why they didn't get the evaluation that they thought they deserved, they are going to think uh, it was uh, it was discriminatory, it was unfair. Uh, actually, lack of transferable skills rather than industry experience, right? We We often look at uh, I think that could go for all of our, our qualifications, actually, the, you know, we set these qualifications and, and sometimes the qualifications aren't the only measure of whether somebody's going to be able to really be competent and perform well in this job. And so we need to look at what are their real skills? What are the competencies they bring? What can we ramp up to make somebody successful in this job? The fact that somebody got has been in this industry for 15 years. Maybe that's a maybe that's a competency. Well, it's not a competency. It's just a fact that they've got 15 years experience. But does that mean they were good at it for 15 years over somebody who's only got four years experience and may really have all the competency and really be a rock star at it? So when we say we need X years of experience or we need this particular college degree or even this certification as a requirement for the job, we may be eliminating a lot of qualified candidates in the process. Optics are everything. That's that's true. Um, and so I think that's why transparency is really important, Courtney. Um, because if I'm doing the right thing, I shouldn't, in most cases, be really that nervous about sharing the outcomes and the reasons for the outcomes. Um, I'm a big, I get that, I get the question a lot from uh, clients about how much they should discuss how the, you know, with an applicant who wants to know how the criminal history uh, that they had affected the hiring decision. And a lot of your attorney, go talk to your attorneys. I'm not your attorney. I'm, I'm not an attorney. I kept my soul. But a lot of your attorneys will tell you, don't ever talk to them about anything. And I just kind of disagree with that. Um, I think if you've got the time as a recruiter uh, to have a thoughtful and meaningful conversation with somebody about your considerations around your hiring decisions, I think that's always to your advantage. Because if they understand that, and you're not saying, you know, you're not pointing out something that was obviously a, a discriminatory, illegally discriminatory decision, then the more they understand that, the better off they are going to be and the better they're going to feel about it rather than thinking they were just treated completely unfairly for some protected class reason and go talk to a plaintiff's lawyer. So use these in your organization. 
build your own as far as trying to decide what is what are the values and the ethical uh, guidelines we're going to use as an organization. So uh, one last thing, um, and I meant to create a poll for this, and I just realized I didn't ever create this poll uh, in Zoom, but in the past year, just let me know uh, which of the following pressures or temptations have you or your hiring managers do you think you faced? Um, consider factors that are illegal. Has that come up? Um, and nobody's going to want to admit all of this uh, with their name associated with it in the chat. But uh, let's just say it this way then. I when, I when I've done this presentation, people raise their hands saying that they're still getting requests from hiring managers to consider factors like Title VII protected classes or the ADA or the ADA, ADEA, don't hire people who, you know, we don't want to hire anybody. We want a young person for this job. Uh, we don't want uh, somebody who's old. We want new ideas, you hear those kind of things. Uh, sometimes employers are asked or recruiters are asked um, to consider things that aren't illegal to consider but aren't really related to the outcome of the job and success in the role. Uh, you know, I think an example of that is uh, when a hiring manager has a preference for uh, graduates from a certain college. And I see this in the engineering area. Well, we want only want engineers who come from this school or we're gonna always prioritize them. Is that gonna get you the most successful engineers? Or is that going to get you a bunch of engineers with the, with who have this who are coming at things with the exact same training, exact same background, and probably limiting uh, the creativity and the diversity of thought in the organization about how you uh, how you might solve specific technical problems? Um, other ones would be to overlook or ignore items suggesting that a candidate may be unqualified. Sometimes we've got a candidate who's not qualified, but a hiring manager wants to ignore that because there are other things that they really like about them that aren't related to the job. Um, and sometimes recruiters are uh, feel pressure to hide uh, relevant information from decision makers. Uh, and I've talked to recruiters who say, well, you know, sometimes I, I, I feel like, yeah, this is relevant, but I'm uh, I'm not, you know, I feel pressure not to tell it, tell the hiring manager about it because I'm afraid they may overreact and give it too much relevance. Well, I would argue that's not your job as a recruiter. Your job is to help that hiring manager make a well-informed decision. So you need to go educate them. But I think, you know, if the information is relevant, you should probably share it with them. Um, what, there's a whole list of them. And I want to get through some of these scenarios before we run out of time today. So uh, when you get the notes, you can read through the rest of those. So let's go through some scenarios. Um, what would you do? Just drop it in the chat. Uh, the hiring manager told you she doesn't want to hire a heavy person for a role because they are lazy. Um, and so Twiggy, the manager, is uh, does not want to hire uh, somebody who, who who's uh, uh, overweight or heavy because she thinks they're lazy. Drop in the chat. What would you do in that circumstance? What would your 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 response be, and how would you address that with that manager? And while you type, uh, I think this is not uncommon, um, and I, I, I my experience has been that it it doesn't impact the the quality of the hire at all. So Jonathan said he would try to point out that it's not a fair assumption. Some of the heaviest pe people in the world are world-class athletes with great work ethic. There you go. And uh, let's see what else. Now we're getting all the comments. Time to coach the hiring manager on bias and re-educate them. Yeah. And we, you know, the bias thing, again, I've got a, uh, a webinar that was recorded last month on, on that very topic. Uh, provide training to the employee so they can, uh, the hiring manager, so they can understand the implications of what they're saying. Talk about bias. That's right. And I think we need to have a lot of conversations around bias in our organization. And I think the other thing to remember, somebody's got, we all have biases. We all do. We all have preferences. We all have things um, that we prefer. And it doesn't mean it's wrong. The thing that makes 
you know, humans really successful is pattern recognition. But sometimes we're misapplying those patterns. And so we really need to evaluate, okay, this is the pattern. This is the reason I feel the way I do about the circumstance. Is that really accurate? And does that really apply in this circumstance of putting this person in this row? Uh, and definitely talk about unintended bias. Uh, the bias king himself, Rodney Klein said, talk to them about bias, but more important, talk about what appeals to them the most, which is getting the best employee. Yeah. So what's in it for me for eliminating my bias? I may get a better employee out of this process. I think that's key. Let's look at another one. The hiring manager asked that you find a male candidate because boys will be boys and the talk around the production line can get pretty salty. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, <laughs> yeah, Diana, I'm sure I'd, I'd, I'd be intimidated if, if I got the look from you, Diana, but Diana said he'd get the look. Uh, and and <laughs> Rodney said, run. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is going to get you sued, first of all. Uh, I mean, we've got a strict compliance issue here. But again, um, we're tolerating bad behavior in our organization is what we're saying. And we're going to say, yeah, well, you know, we've got this bad, unhealthy environment that we're going to tolerate because they meet their production quotas, maybe. Uh, Jackie said, suggest HR or hire manager look into the conversations. Yeah, exactly. We may need, this may be enough to, to start an internal investigation and figure out why uh, the culture is so bad in this work group. Ah, good. Uh, Matthew advised that men need to take care of the boys, that that we, you know, we need to, we need to train these uh good old boys to be professionals and fix the environment and then look to hire the, the best candidate. Right. And uh, that would be another ethical issue. It's a different issue altogether. Uh, but what if we know we've got a toxic environment that is uh, really inappropriate and, and these boys will be boys or having this, these conversations on the production floor that are really ugly and you've got a qualified female uh, candidate for this role, but you know what she's going to be subjected to out there. It's a whole other ethical issue. But what do you do in that circumstance? Uh, maybe the, the, you know management is unwilling to change that, or they're working on it, but they don't want to fire everybody. So they're trying to get this. So what's your responsibility to that candidate? Do you at least give them a heads up? Uh, and by giving them a heads up, are you telling them, take this job so you can sue us for a, a Title VII violation down the road? Um, and so, you know, those are those are challenging questions uh, about what's your responsibility? How do you balance the responsibility of the organization against the, your responsibility to the candidate to make sure that you're being transparent about what they're walking into? That's a, that'd be a hard, hard one to do. Look at this one. Company owner told you to hire a specific candidate for a posted position because he's a good kid and his parents are the owner's friend, but the candidate is not the most qualified person. What do you do in this circumstance? Is this, is this an unethical request from the owner of the company? Curious to see what you think about that. Is this an unethical request from the owner of the company? I can hear all the clicking going on. Yes, it's unethical. Uh, so Brianna says it's unethical. Mar Marcella says, uh, yes, it's not ethical. How, how do you respond to this, this owner? What would your response? If you think this is unethical, uh, illegal, no, unethical, heck yes. Okay, so what would your response to the owner of this private company be? How would you how would you uh, address that? And while y'all do this, uh, let me tell you, I'm not sure it's unethical. Um, when it's the owner of the company, you're protecting. I mean, uh, it's you know, it's the ostensibly, it's the owner's money, right? And if the owner makes a conscious choice to uh, hire somebody who's not the most competent person for that role and waste their own money on it is that, I mean, it's a horrible business decision, uh, but um, 
maybe it's not maybe it's not an unethical decision it's just as rodney said stupid yes unethical no uh, i think when when the request comes from someone other than the sole owner of the organization it's different i think if it's uh uh certainly a publicly traded company or even a pe firm where the stated purpose of the organization is to make money for the pe firm then always putting 100 percent putting the best person for in in the role is uh is the ethical thing to do uh the other side of it is i would be very comfortable telling them the owner uh okay well if we've not posted the job yet and you just want to hire this guy and put him in this role great but if we posted the job we have an ethical responsibility to all those candidates who applied to make sure they're evaluated fairly uh they took the time to apply even if it was three minutes or 10 minutes or or 20 minutes to to go through the application process we at least we owe them a little something we owe them to at least be uh you know to to be treated fairly in the process so i think there are a lot of different considerations there uh if there are other qualified candidates that can lead to discrimination issue yeah if somebody happens to have uh be in a protected class and this person's not at least it gives the perception that it's discrimination now if the decision really wasn't because that person you know if it had no issue you know the the age race sex national origin religion or protected other protected status of that candidate didn't play into the hiring decision uh then i don't think you've got a discrimination issue i think what you've got is just somebody spending their money in a bad way maybe uh and jackie said strongly suggest the owner at least interview other qualified candidates and hopefully realize there are better choices that's that's a good approach jackie my my concern with that is i think you'd have to evaluate is this is this the kind of owner what's my experience with this owner is this going to be somebody who's made his mind up you know he wants to give this kid a shot and maybe he plays golf with the kid's dad all the time or whatever uh and we know he's not going to change his mind he's already made a commitment to his buddy he's going to hire his kid uh then do I really want to waste these other candidates time? Is that fair to them uh, to do that? So those kind of considerations, I think, really need to come in place there. So great comments here, guys. We are at uh, at 58 minutes. And so when you get the, uh, I'm just going to show you, when you get the slides, uh, you'll see that there are just a lot of questions here that I put together and they don't all have they don't have answers uh but i think this would be this may be your version of cards against humanity uh for uh your hr next hr meeting maybe y'all go through and ask these questions of of one another and, and have conversations around some of this um so thank you all for your responses i i i love it this is really a hard one i've uh first time i've delivered this over uh a webinar i've done it in person several times now and i really enjoy doing it in person because we can actually talk to each other uh and it's harder to do when we're, we're dealing it uh over webinar but thank you for for uh bearing with me in chat and giving me responses uh, my contacts there you will get an email if you're watching this live you will get an email that gives you the opportunity to uh give me a little feedback on how i did and then you'll get the research information all that and if uh you're watching this on the recording on our website please uh use the keyword ethics e-t-h-i-c-h no that's not how you spell it e-t-h-i-c-s ethics that will get you you put that on the form below the the recording and that will get you the research information uh for for this webinar as well and please don't forget Good morning, HR. Uh, every Thursday morning, uh, we drop a new episode and uh, they're all pre-approved for HRCI and research credit. Uh, and so, uh, and Elizabeth, ethics, good question. Ethics uh, is not case sensitive on our website. So, um, but if you're watching this live, you will get, you'll get the, uh, the email. You won't need to worry about the ethics uh, keyword. But again, ethics is the keyword if you're watching the recording. Thank you all. Uh, oh, thank you, John, that you listened to Good Morning HR. I knew somebody did, so now I know who. So thank you, John. I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody. Thank you so much.
Uh, if you have questions, I'll stick around for a little bit and answer any, but uh, I will. Uh, oh, thank you, Jackie. So, um, uh, but if, if there aren't any questions and y'all, are, but I'll stick around as long as people are telling me how great they, how great I am too. So that's, uh, that's always great too. Thank you, Helen. Well, I sure appreciate it. Y'all have a, a great week. I'm off on vacation tomorrow. So I, I'm going off on a guy, a long guy's weekend with some friends. And so I'm going to have fun outside of the country. And so, uh, but I hope I see you at a conference soon. Uh, and if not, I will see you on uh, maybe on the webinar, uh, future webinar. Uh, we've got one coming up in May uh, and then, uh, or on the Good Morning HR podcast. So until I see you next, be well, do good, keep your chin up. Have a good one. Bye-bye.